The trial of four Viewford residents accused of killing British national Roger Pratt was expected to commence today, Monday, January 20th, 2020. The 62-year-old was killed six years ago when bandits allegedly attacked him and his wife while their boat was docked near Viewfort. According to multiple media reports, on the night of January 17, 2014, Roger Pratt and his wife Margaret Pratt discovered four men aboard their vessel Magnetic Attraction. The two were subsequently beaten by the men and at some point Roger Pratt was tipped overboard. It is unclear whether he fell or was thrown overboard. However, his lifeless body was later retrieved from the water. Days later, Kervin DeVoe, Fanias Joseph, Richie Kern and Jeremiah Jones were charged with the offences of murder and robbery and were subsequently remanded into custody at the Bodily Correctional Facility. But before this long-awaited trial could actually commence, one of the accused, Richie Kern, was required to undergo a fitness hearing to determine his competency to stand trial. We were unable to confirm the results of Monday's fitness hearing. However, what we do know is that if Richie Kern is deemed to be fit, he is expected to stand trial alongside the other three accused. However, if he is not deemed to be fit, he is expected to be remanded and his matter will be reviewed separately. Pratt's shocking death made headlines both locally and internationally. Since then, his widow, Margaret Pratt, has launched an unwavering campaign for justice. Good morning. My name's Margaret Pratt and I'm talking to you because um, in January 2014, my husband, Roger Pratt, was murdered in St. Lucia. Over the years, Margaret Pratt has lamented the slow pace of justice in St. Lucia, voicing severe dissatisfaction with what she believes to be several delays in these proceedings, including much needed renovations at the criminal court, which resulted in a backlog of hundreds of cases, including that of her husband, Roger Pratt. This was referenced in Margaret Pratt's open letter to the Prince of Wales in 2019, where she requested his assistance in encouraging St. Lucian officials to ensure justice. The Prince visited St. Lucia in March of 2019 to mark the island's 40th independence anniversary celebrations. In the letter, Margaret Pratt explains that, quote, Since April 2018, the one and only criminal court in St. Lucia has been closed due to an ongoing disagreement around the cost of renovation to the facility, end quote. On Monday, Margaret Pratt reported to the courthouse where trial proceedings were expected to begin. She is one of the main witnesses in this matter. However, after a nearly three-hour wait, she was seen leaving the courthouse, at which point reporters were informed that the matter was adjourned. Margaret Pratt's wait for justice has been a long and agonizing one. However, according to a lawyer involved in the matter, these proceedings are expected to be somewhat lengthy. Choice News will continue to bring you updates as they become available. Reporting from outside the Naira Court, for Choice News Now, I am Amani Mathre. Four view fortunes have pled not guilty in relation to the 2014 death of British national Roger Pratt. Although our news cameras were not allowed into the courtroom, I sat in on the long-awaited trial, which commenced on Tuesday, January 28th. This comes after last week's competency hearing, which determined that one of the defendants, Richie Kern, was fit to stand trial alongside the other three individuals accused of causing Roger Pratt's death. As the trial began, the Director of Public Prosecutions, Dazrian Green, addressed the 15-member jury laying out the state's allegations. According to Green, it is being alleged that on the night of January 17, 2014, at about 11 p.m., four men ventured aboard Pratt's vessel, the Magnetic Attraction, with the intention to cause serious bodily harm. In so doing, they injured and caused the death of the 62-year-old. Meanwhile, just feet away from the DPP, the four defendants, Richie Kern, Jeremiah Jones, Kevin DeVoe and Fannis Joseph, sat together flanked by two police officers. Green impressed on the jury that on the night of Pratt's death, the four men embarked on a joint enterprise. That is, they went together with a common purpose. He further suggested that while there are differences in the initial statements made by the four defendants, there is one commonality, that they were all present when the offense was committed. After these opening statements, the prosecution called the first witness to the stand, a witness who provided compelling testimony which detailed many key aspects of that night, including the discovery of Pratt's body and the gruesome crime scene. 
Witness testimony alleges that on the night of January 17, 2014, they were anchored about 400 to 500 feet in front of Pratt's vessel near Las Besson in Viewfort. According to the witness, around 11 p.m., they were aboard their vessel when they heard loud screams. The witness told the court that they subsequently went to the high-frequency radio aboard their own vessel where they heard a mayday call from magnetic attraction. The witness asserts that at the time, they had never met or spoken to Margaret Pratt or her husband before. When they spoke to Margaret Pratt over the radio, she stated that her husband was missing. When asked if she needed assistance, Margaret Pratt said yes, prompting the witness to paddle to the Pratt's vessel using a kayak and a headlamp. According to the individual, as they put the kayak into the water, they could see something moving in the water. However, according to the witness, it was quite dark. I listened intently as the witness described what happened next. The individual recounted to the court that when they arrived near the magnetic attraction, they noticed a primitive wooden rowboat attached to the vessel. The DPP had earlier told the court that it was believed that a small rowboat had been used by the men to gain access to the magnetic attraction. The court listened with keen interest as the witness described his first encounter with Margaret Pratt. The witness stated, quote, I saw a woman, approximately mid-60s, standing on the deck of magnetic attraction. She was disheveled and had blood on her. She repeated that her husband was missing, end quote. The witness does not recall seeing anyone else on the boat at that time. From the witness's testimony, they did not know at the time that someone had died. All they knew was that someone was believed to be overboard. According to the witness, they began to paddle westward on the south side of the line of vessels. They feared that the current would carry the person out to sea. They subsequently made a gruesome discovery that would change Margaret Pratt's life forever. A naked Caucasian man floating face down a few inches under the water. The witness described what happened next. I jumped in the water. I swam to him. I rolled him over on his back, pulled his head out the water. I yelled his name in his air. I could not perform CPR in the water, so I called for help. There was no response when I called in his air. He was not breathing. He was very white. End quote. According to the witness, two crew members from another vessel came to his assistance aboard a dinghy. They pulled Roger Pratt out of the water and one crew member immediately performed CPR. The witness subsequently went aboard the magnetic attraction where they encountered the shocking crime scene. They described the scene as follows. It was a mess. There was blood on the cockpit, blood on the floors. Inside the boat, there was material everywhere, all over the table, end quote. After being questioned by the prosecutor, the witness was excused from the court as defense lawyers for the accused had opted not to engage in cross-examination. Shortly after this, the first day of trial wrapped up after nearly three hours. The four accused men were marched out of the courtroom one day closer to the verdict which will determine their fate. Trial proceedings are expected to continue throughout this week. Other witnesses who are scheduled to appear before the court include Margaret Pratt, Pratt's widow, the pathologist who performed the post-mortem, and the investigating officer who preferred the murder charges. One attorney has suggested that the trial could last several weeks. I intend to follow this trial closely and will continue to report on the details. For Choice News Now, Amani Master reporting. I was just interested in survival. These were the words uttered by British widow Margaret Pratt as she relived the night her husband Roger Pratt was killed. For the second consecutive day, I sat in on the trial that will determine the fate of the four men accused of causing Pratt's death back in 2014. This time, my media colleagues and I were joined by attorney at law, Lon Theophilus, who was tourism minister at the time of Pratt's death, as well as at least one representative from the office of the British High Commission. Before Margaret Pratt took the stand, the court first heard testimony from an officer of the Scenes of Crime Office of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. The officer recalled that at about 2 a.m. on January 18, 2014, they responded to a report of a homicide at Las Besor View Fort. With assistance from the Marine Police Unit, they ventured to the scene, the magnetic attraction, a vessel belonging to Margaret and Roger Pratt. There, the officer conducted a visual examination of the crime scene, taking photos and collecting exhibits which were preserved to be brought to court. 
During questioning from the Director of Public Prosecutions, the officer was asked to identify several photos which had been submitted to the court as evidence. These included photos of what appeared to be blood droplets on the deck of the vessel as well as on the controls. The officer also identified photos which appeared to depict blood droplets near the entrance to the cabin and blood stains on the bed sheet inside the cabin. Other photos of exhibits from the scene include a blue bandana and a pistol grip which were found aboard the vessel on the night of the incident. The officer further told the court that on January 20th, 2014, they went to the Victoria Hospital morgue to continue investigations into this reported homicide. There, they met Margaret Pratt, Roger Pratt's widow. The officer recounted that they took several photos of her for court purposes. These photos, which were shared with the court, depicted apparent injuries to the woman's head and the left side of her body. There were also close-up photos which showed bruising to her face, particularly around the eyes. The attorneys for the defendants opted not to cross-examine the witness at that time, as the prosecution had expressed an intention to pursue further questioning later down the line. Moments after these photos were displayed, Margaret Pratt herself was called to the stand, where she sat just feet away from the four men accused of causing the death of her husband. The widow has been seeking justice for six years. At the request of the prosecution, she provided a detailed description of the vessel's layout and described the couple's activities leading up to their arrival in Beaufort. She then proceeded to recount the day which would eventually end in her husband's death. She noted that after venturing into the town earlier in the afternoon, the couple returned to their vessel and eventually retired to bed sometime around 10 p.m. At some point during the night, she recalled hearing movement on the deck above their bed. She says her husband Roger got up and went to have a look as she followed. She heard her husband say, quote, go away, just go away, end quote. Pratt says that after that, everything, quote, moved very, very quickly, end quote. The widow told the courts that she remembered seeing three men on the stern of the boat. She says she was then grabbed in a headlock and pulled onto the seat of the cockpit. She recalled being held down hard by one man while another man punched her head, face and upper body. Pratt further told the court, quote, I saw my husband wrestling with another man on the stern of the boat. I was screaming and shouting. I couldn't move and I was being beaten, end quote. She described the man who was beating her as having a bandana scarf over his nose and the bottom of his face. Pratt says she asked her attacker, quote, what are you wearing this for, end quote, and clawed at his bandana mask. According to the British National, as he was beating her up, her attacker kept demanding money using obscene language. Pratt stated that she indicated that there was no money using the same expletives. She says although she was attempting to use her legs to bar the attacker's entry into the saloon of the boat, he eventually did get past her, went into the saloon and came back almost immediately with her computer. Apart from the initial sighting of her husband wrestling, Pratt says she didn't see what happened to him as she was, quote, simply focused on surviving, end quote. She continued her testimony describing what happened next. She recalls that, quote, all of a sudden, someone said something. It wasn't something I understood, but the effect was instantaneous, end quote. According to Pratt, the beating stopped instantly and the men leapt over the side of the vessel, disappearing within seconds. Pratt noted that she soon realized she was alone on the boat, at which point she began shouting, where are you, Roger? Where are you? She told the court that she then realized she was going to have to try to find her husband and subsequently lowered the dinghy into the water in an attempt to help her husband come back into the boat from the water. She then descended into the saloon and made a mayday call to what she thought would be the Viewfort Coast Guard. She says there was an immediate response and she described the nature of the emergency, stating that they had been attacked and her husband was missing. According to Pratt, assistance came quickly from two other nearby vessels. On the first day of trial, one of those individuals had described finding Roger Pratt in the water and their attempts to provide CPR. Unfortunately, I had to leave the courtroom shortly after 4 p.m. in order to prepare my reporting. When I left, the court was taking a quick break and Margaret Pratt had not finished testifying. The trial continues on Thursday and I will be back in court to observe the proceedings and report on what transpires during the day. For Choice News Now, Amani Mathra reporting. After lengthy deliberations, a jury has returned the following verdict in the highly publicized Roger Pratt trial. 
Jeremiah Jones, Richie Kern, and Kevin DeVoe have all been found guilty of murder. Fannis Joseph, however, has been found not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. I am very pleased with the, with the time of deliberation of the Tribunal of Fact. They, I believe they, they, they listened quite attentively to the evidence. There was a lot of evidence, I mean, presented by the Crown, and they, they did justice to their duty, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of, in terms of the, the time, the deliberation. And I mean, I can't comment on that. That is their avenue. They being the judges of fact. They have returned their verdict and I am satisfied. Of the four defendants, only Fannis Joseph was found not guilty of the murder charge which was brought against all four men by the state. Joseph had maintained that he had not gone aboard the Pratt's vessel and also claimed that he threw a life-saving device to Roger Pratt upon seeing him in the water. I am um, pleased that the jury had quite a task and that they were able to return with a verdict of manslaughter. Of course, if you know me personally, I always go for whatever that I can get as being the best outcome for my client. And I, I would prefer a better outcome for my client, but um, the jury has spoken at this time. And so that's all I could say. We also obtained comments from Alberton Richelieu, attorney for Jeremiah Jones. Honestly, I'm not surprised at the verdict in relation to him. Although I know that if the jury was the jury was properly directed that they would have strictly come back with a manslaughter but i am not i am not i am not surprised in light of the directions which are given do you have any plans to appeal oh there are no two ways about that uh, an appeal is forthcoming on that richelieu is confident that an appeal will provide a favorable outcome for his client this is an area of the law which since 2016 in relation to a Privy Council decision, the, we, have, we have to test it in order to be able to at least improve on our jurisprudence because the Privy Council decision which was given in 2016 has to be complemented with the provisions of our code. And the provisions of our code, in my view, were never in fact put to the jury, whether either literally or in a way consistent with the spirit of the code. In layman's terms, can you just explain to me the, the, what you're referencing, the 2016 decision? Well, the 2016 decision is one which changed the law from, from at first, the, the whole question of finding people guilty of murder was an ingredient that if the person had the foresight, and they have since changed to intention. But in our law, uh, but in, in, intention in our law is specifically defined. That aspect of it was never put to the jury. Secondly, there is also the provision in our code which makes provisions for different states of mind in relation to circumstances of that nature. That was not put to the jury. So I think that I'm pretty confident that the, um, it would be a different result on appeal. Kevin DeVoe's attorney, David Moyston, will also be appealing the verdict. I was hoping for a different outcome in this matter. Right? Um, it's not really what I expected. But at the end of the day, the jury adjudicated and came to a verdict. Do you plan on, on filing an appeal on, on... Yes. That's automatic. That's automatic, really. <laughs> Especially in light of the fact that he was found guilty of murder. At the time, we were unable to secure a comment from Sandy John, attorney for Richie Kern. In statements provided to police days after the incident, Kern admitted to repeatedly hitting Pratt and seeing him fall overboard. Roger Pratt's widow had been present for most of the trial. However, Margaret Pratt left the island just days before the verdict was handed down. We were able to obtain a brief comment from her moments after the convictions. I'm relieved that finally, after six plus years, we finally have justice for Roger. I'd like to thank the jury for their careful consideration and Mr. Green for his tireless search for justice. Now I'm just going to reflect on the outcome. As of yet, the four defendants do not know how long they will be spending behind bars. Before their sentences can be handed down, the defense and prosecution will receive pre-sentencing reports and prepare their submissions on sentencing. A psychiatric report is also required for those defendants convicted of murder. Sentencing is expected on April 6, 2020. Reporting from outside the Naira court, 
for Choice News Now, I am Amani Mathur.